Okay, everybody, I, I'm going to get us started. Um, I'm, for those who don't know me, I'm David Summergrad, uh, president of the Needham Diversity Initiative. And um, we are one of the sponsoring groups for this evening's uh, special presentation, along with the Needham Public, Public Library and um, with, in partnership with the Needham CPAC organization. Um, and we know that several other organizations in Needham and elsewhere have shared their invitation pretty widely. Um, I have a few things to share before I introduce Lillian. Um, the first is that we, um, we've been planning this event for a couple of months, um, thinking it was going to be uh, hosted at the Needham Free Public Library, and we we're delighted that we were able to um, still pull it off in, in this virtual environment. Um, I saw uh, a, a quick like video of a four-year-old girl um, who was talking about, you know, that was before. So the, I think we're going to be referring to the before um, of, of all of these things that we're going through, all the challenges that we're going through with this health crisis and the pandemic. But luckily, we're able to work around those things and pull this together. Um, the quick ground rules for the session are this. Um, once we're ready to start, I'm going to have everybody, I'll put everybody on mute and um, except for Lillian <laughs> and um, there is a chat feature that you can find on my screen it's just a visible screen that's the place to put your comments and questions and I think Lillian had said she would prefer to do questions at the end so she will be able to scroll through those or we'll share those with her and um, as mentioned some of you heard that this session is being recorded so without further rules about Zoom. Um, it's, it's my pleasure, delight actually, to um, turn things over to Lillian Elmore. Um, I met Lillian a few years ago when she was a student at uh, Explo, Exploration School Inc. at Wellesley College. Um, and we have stayed in touch ever since. Lillian is now a senior at Lexington High School. And um, I will, I don't want to share too many of the wonderful and amazing things that Lillian has done. I will let her hear those herself, but she's going to share her story and her thoughts with us um, in this presentation called Empowering Those with Disabilities. I'm hoping you all have that presentation up on the screen. Um, and Lillian will go through that and, and explain um, what we're going to be finding out. So Lillian, thank you so much for doing this. And, and I'm going to mute everybody else and unmute you and then we'll start. Hi, everybody. So before I start, I just want to say a quick thank you to David and everybody on the Needham Diversity Initiative for not only recruiting me to speak at this wonderful event, but uh, making it digital so we could still experience some bit of normalcy during this interesting little uh, spontaneous vacation, as I like to call it. Uh, hopefully I can relieve some boredom. So uh, I appreciate you guys coming at, or coming up and doing this. Thought I had this, okay, there it is. All right, so who am I? I am a senior at Lexington High School, as previously stated. I live with spastic quadriplegia, which is a form of cerebral palsy. And for those of you who don't know, Cerebral palsy is a neuromuscular condition that basically tells your brain to send the wrong signals to your body. So my body is constantly being told to contract by my brain so it can have some issues with mobility, which is why I have the chair as well as some other issues with chronic pain and things like that. But I've never let that stop me doing things I want to do. I'm headed to High Point University in High Point, North Carolina which is my top school after a gap year that I'm taking to gain functional mobility. Um, other than the wheelchair, I'm just like any other teenage girl. I love friends, singing, poetry, speaking, dogs, and food. Um, I am more than my cerebral palsy and I face challenges every day, but they have given me perspective, motivation, and empathy that I wouldn't otherwise have. I mean, I'm getting to speak with all you guys here through the lovely internet. How cool is that? I was born with my disabilities, but growing up, I never knew I was disabled. My parents made sure I could do everything that the other kids could do. I climbed, swam, rode bikes, you name it, I probably did it. 
with my mom and dad acting as my arms and legs. As a toddler, my sister would grab my foot, drag me around the house and say, look ma, she's walking. Even my dog dragged me around in the snow by the edge of my snow pants, as if he too understood that I couldn't get around. I played tag with the other kids in the neighborhood, chasing them in my power chair. You can imagine how dangerous tag becomes when one has a giant monster truck essentially attached to their butt. Then in middle school, I had a holy schnitzel moment, the moment where time stopped and it was hard to see beyond the negative. Why me? Why this? I struggled to find role models, people who could show me how this was supposed to be done. But there, there weren't any I could relate to, and I was really angry. So I realized I had a choice. And that choice was spurred by three things that changed my perspective. So I chose the better path. Um, the first thing that changed my perspective was uh, finding role models. So I am now actually, wait, yes, finding role models. I am a part of a group of 180 women who get together around the world from in Los Angeles, and they're all in chairs, and we perform hip hop dance together. The dance opportunity is great, but the sisterhood is even better. It's awesome to be able to just be around folks that understand what living like this is like. The second was mentorship and community service. It became a fire that was lit inside me. I started small, helping my friends win challenges. There's a blind girl at my school who struggled to assimilate among the typical students. I was a peer mentor at the time, and I had weekly, the, the peer mentors were basically just there to kind of help assimilate the freshmen or struggling students, and I was assigned to her, and we had weekly lunch sessions so she could connect and say what was on her mind. Now, we both have vision issues, so our issues working together gave uh, new meaning to the phrase, the blind meeting the blind, which, was ve which could be very interesting. Uh, the third was public speaking. I love being able to speak with groups such as yourself, and it just makes me feel so much better, and I know that I'm making an impact speaking in front of groups like you guys. Um, every new group I speak with, I'm more excited about the future for people living with disabilities. I recently spoke to an amazing third grade class. This is a picture of me and one of the girls. Um, her name, I won't say her name, but she also has CP, so really cool seeing her. And they were, they were pretty fearless in asking questions and wanting to know more, not only about my differences, but how we were similar, which was really cool. Questions like, why do you wear leg braces if you have a wheelchair? And how do you swim? Showed me that they were trying to really walk in my shoes, no pun intended. My favorite question of the session was, what's your favorite video game? When I told them I didn't play video games, there was a collective gasp among the auditorium. Every step I take to help grow awareness fuels me, as I know we can all work together to help people with disabilities lead more productive lives. The title of this session is called Empowering People with Disabilities. So I'm gonna talk about three ideas that may lead to better empowerment. First, inclusion is not enough. It is not enough to open doors or add buttons or ramps. We need to find ways to break down visible and invisible barriers. And no, I'm not talking about a broken elevator. Heck, when that happens, I use the opportunity to find a hot guy to lift me upstairs. The type of changes I'm talking about are broader. My mom and I went to New York City recently, as with their public transportation system, it seems like it might be a great place for me to go to college. But do you know that over 2,000 curbs in Manhattan have no cutouts? Wrapped up in my parka, I looked like a big pink fluff on wheels, playing an advanced game of Frogger, just trying to cross the street. And getting down to the subway, a nice stranger had to help us force open a door to an elevator that had no lights and looked like it hadn't been used since the Reagan administration. As we rolled into the darkness of the tiny broken elevator and the smell of urine filled the air, the stranger's only words were, oh my. Welcome to accessibility, I said. He responded, accessibility is sketchy. As I rolled onto the platform and the subway car pulled to a stop, we all realized that in an instant, there was a four inch gap between the edge of the platform and the car. A gap that a front, that a front wheel of a wheelchair could easily get stuck in. 
and I knew that gap could force me to an untimely and still reinforced death, but I made the split second decision to get on. I yelled, charged, and we roared toward the subway car. Feeling like Harry Potter on platform nine and three quarters, we used momentum and speed to blast onto the train. Thankfully, we got, we got on before a wheel, a wheel got stuck or a door could crash. Me. And in case you're wondering, my friend's skeletal structures were also spared. I marveled at, this, at how someone in a wheelchair must navigate that obstacle course adventure every day to find a way to work. But if you think that sounds challenging, at least the physical barriers are easy to see. It is the stereotypes that are harder to overcome. The next area to help empower others is to change the conversation from pity to perspective. You know those words that drive you crazy like moist or taxes? The words that drive me the most crazy every single day are, I'm sorry. I've heard those words almost every day of my life, my entire life. But guess what? I am not sorry for having a disability. Yes, it is brutal sometimes, but we all have challenges. Mine are just on the outside. Uh, now, I know there's a raising hand feature, so we're going to use that for a sec. How many here have seen a movie, where, uh, such as Me Before You, where the hero is combined to a wheelchair, and everybody acts like he's some social pariah from another planet, going through a strange, twisted version of his own hell, until one day he's finally cured, jumps out of the wheelchair, and everybody around him cries, here's a joy while sappy violin music plays in the background. Trust me, I know we've seen, we've all seen these, myself included. I don't know if any of you have raised your hand, because I don't know if, if that feature works, but I'm just going to assume that some of you have. Um, the world spends all this time portraying disability as this negative tragedy, and that can start to mess with your head a little bit. You start to believe that your life is a lie and that you should be sad all the time, which I don't think is a good way to be. Instead, it is so much better to value the unique perspective that people with challenges have that can enrich so many aspects of life. Give those unique perspectives a seat at the table. Hold people with disabilities accountable to the expectations that you hold others to. I had a woman come up to me on a gorgeous day and say, oh, I love seeing people like you get outside on a day like today. And my first thought was, people like me, what? Oh, you must mean sassy people. My other favorite example is when I'm sitting in like a complete couch potato in my chair, doing absolutely nothing, and strangers come up to me and say, you're such an inspiration. Yup, I'm totally an inspiration sitting on my butt all day. Instead of holding me up as an object of pity or inspiration, connect with me. And so that's where the third area of empowerment comes in. The third area of empowerment is connection. As much as I love my Instagram, you'll see uh, a quick shout out to follow me on my social medias at the end of this presentation. Uh, it is real connections with real people that provide empowerment. I rely on other people to help me with all the really intimate activities of daily living. This can get awkward. Although this carries a lot of discomfort for me, I also know that this forced intimacy has given me a unique opportunity to form stronger connections than I thought possible. In turn, those real connections provide strength, joy, and empowerment in so many different situations. My feeling deeply connected to my community gives me the confidence to roll out into this world and face even the toughest days of pain, exclusion, and prejudice. Connection is critically important for people with disabilities, as they experience isolation at a much greater rate than those without. How many times have I not been invited to a birthday party because a kid assumed that I couldn't partake and didn't want me to feel bad, or their parents thought it would be more work to find an adaptation? This happened often with trampoline, bouncy house, or sports party, until one day, one of my best friends invited me to her skating party on Frog Pond, and there I was doing donuts in my chair while she was doing demo acting. Despite reservations that something may be too hard for a person with a disability, include them and let them figure out how to adapt the situation. Ask questions. I've had children attempt to come up to me and ask me questions, only to have their parents pull them away and harshly tell them not to bother me. I've had adults whisper to each other, what's wrong with her, when they think I don't hear. I'm just like any other human and want to be able to talk and connect with you. So please ask questions and don't be afraid to learn more. Isolation leads to vulnerability and depression. So connection is really important. Finally, 
Did you know that science has us all projected to live a life longer than those before us? Meaning that we can all live to 100 or longer? How cool is that? Like, think about this guy. We can be happy like this old guy over here. We're living at like 107. That'd be so cool. Um, with that extended life, is it expected that one third of us will become disabled as we advance to our senior year? All the work we do, we do to empower those with disabilities will not only improve our workplace, bring new ideas, and help others in important and powerful ways, but it'll also help us prepare for our future selves to live a full and wonderful life. Thank you again for this amazing opportunity. I would love to ask questions, and as much as I love questions, as you probably already know, I love connection even more. So at the end of this, I would love to meet, meet each and every one of you and hear what is going on in your world. Thank you so much. So I've, awesome. I've unmuted people, but also we can use the chat feature for questions. Uh, I'm going to scroll through the, the chat, I guess. Um, I don't know. Okay, I don't know how to switch. Can you shut down? Maybe um, unshare your screen. I don't think I see any questions in the chat right now. Um, but y'all can type, or I don't know. Um, I, I love questions, so please don't be shy. I've gotten triggered, asking me all sorts of stuff. Netflix, nothing is off the table. I've, I've got one to start with while people are thinking of questions, Lillian. Very thing. Tell us what, what went into your college decision for uh, what were the features? Well, um, I get really sick during the end of time. And so I knew I wanted something with a less harsh winter. So I knew I wanted to go down south. And I wanted a smaller school, so I wouldn't be yeah, like a number in a lecture hall, because I know I have some very never wanted to know like so I chose a smaller um, school for Zero. Hold on, Lillian, I'm gonna unmute you. So I can find there we go. Sorry. Okay, so um, but my college decision really went on a couple of things. I get really sick in the cold. My, my pain symptoms get really aggravated. And so I love uh, being in Boston where it's like three quarters of the year is winter. It's like, oh, wow, I'm three quarters of the year in discomfort. So I knew I wanted that to change. Um, so I knew I was going down south. And I wanted a smaller school because I know I have some very specialized, like, things that I like for education, so I wanted to be able to carry those needs over um, with me. And then I just walked onto High Point's campus and they really did their best to make me feel so welcome and wonderful. Um, for my gap year, uh, ooh, so many, so many, uh, so many questions, okay. The chat, okay, where do I start? Do I start at the top or the bottom? I'm so confused, okay. Um, Okay, so 2021 Mia's to everybody. That was incredible. The world needs to hear your voice. You ever get nervous while public speaking? Do you have tips for public speakers? Yes, I get nervous all the time. Like, if you can't tell, when I get nervous, I talk really fast. So if I was talking really fast, it was because I was nervous and excited. Um, my tip would just, just say, go for it. Just push past the nerves, and it'll get easier as time goes on. Um, but thank you for saying the world needs to hear my voice. What types of things, oh, this is for Anna, hi. Uh, what types of things do you plan on doing during your gap year? Very good question. Um, I'm working on gaining functional ability. So I'm doing a lot of like therapy intensives with my a couple of therapy programs. I'm trying to get a service dog, a uh, second service dog because I already have one who's retired and uh, just gain more like function to be able to live on my own. Well, okay, this is from Marlene Schultz. Thank you for the question. Um, will I be able to live alone at college? What are, your, what are my career goals? Okay, so I'll start with the career goals because those are a little more straightforward. I wanna be a disability advocacy lawyer on Capitol Hill 
don't know how that's gonna work, but I'm sure I'll figure it out. And I don't know that my answer is probably not completely alone because I do need a lot of support. I'm trying to gain as much function so I don't need as much support, but there's always gonna be moments where I'm gonna need support. So I'll probably have either like a personal care attendant come in and uh, help me in the morning at night or I'll have them sleep over. It really depends, but I'm hoping to live away from the watchful eye of my parents and be able to gain some young adult independence. And thank you for everybody for saying I'm inspirational. I really appreciate it. There are so many questions. Ah, ah, wow, okay. Oof. You want me to scroll? I don't know how to scroll. Okay, I've, Raven Registry says, I would love to hear more about your sibling. Uh, I just have one, yes, you are right. Her name is Madeline, and she's a freshman at UCLA studying bio. She's pretty cool, I, I like to say. She, you know, we drive each other crazy, but we also love each other. Thank you for all the compliments, everybody. I, I appreciate it. It's very sweet of all you guys. I think right now that's all we have for questions, but I'll let everybody uh, take some more if they want to. You guys are so sweet. I'm going to cry. Oh my goodness. I don't want to mess with my makeup, but if I didn't have any makeup on, I'd be crying. What made you decide on the disability law path? Thank you, Kara. Um, well, I guess I was just seeing like all the injustices and like this mom. People are asking questions. Uh, sorry, that's my mom. She loves to take pictures of everything I do. Um, uh, yeah, but uh, what was I? Oh yeah, what made you want to decide on the disability advocacy law path? I guess seeing all the injustices that like I personally face as a person with a disability and that my friends with disabilities face, I didn't want to sit around and just like deal with the injustices because like that's just really sad and depressing. And so I was like, I want to do something about it. And my mom always tells me that I always win our arguments. She thought law would be a good profession, so here we are. Ooh, Dale says that her and her husband are both lawyers. That is cool. Uh, thank you, everybody, for all these lovely compliments. I mean, oh my god, this is just, no, I'm getting inundated. Getting flustered, okay. Uh, how are your parents handling you leaving co for college? Um, oh, do you want to answer that one? <laughs> I'll let you answer. Um, I don't know. I guess like they're just like any other parent whose kid is leaving for college and a mixture of relief because they get to go off and do their, their old people thing and then uh, scared because they're like, she could blow up the college and do something crazy. I'm here with my children who are seven and nine. Do you have a message for kids who are younger? Oh, that's a good one. I have a lot of messages. I guess just say, stick up for disabled people. Let them play with you. Ask them if they want to play and just treat them like you would any other kid. What advice would you give to other kids who are angry about their disability and or chronic condition? Well, I'd say you have two choices, my friend. You can either sit there and you can be angry and you can say, oh my God, why me? Like, this is an issue. And you can just sulk and be sad and not see all the wonderful things that this might give to you. Or you can say, okay, I'll let myself be angry for a little bit, but now I gotta get up and I gotta go do something that's gonna make me happy and make me wanna impact this world. Because once you do that, then all these opportunities are gonna come your way. What was your most challenging course in high school? Oof, oof. Anything related to trigonometry and geometry? As somebody with a visual impairment, geometry is not my friend. Shapes, shapes are disgusting and I hate them all. <laughs> you guys are so sweet, oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm sending all my ritual love and Hugs to you, I guess. Um, I hear that. 
How much do you feel supported by your teachers, says Ariva. Uh, well, one of my, a couple of my teachers are on here, and they're awesome, at least the ones that are on here. For the most part, I feel pretty supported by my teachers. They're, they're all, like, at least now, they're all really awesome and cool, and I, I love them all. Um, and they're like my, my, I call them my school parents because they, they make sure to look out for me, which is really, really sweet. What kind of music do you like? I like every kind of music, except for like death metal and like electronic. Sorry for any death metal slash electronic fans, but that just ain't my jam. But you can catch me listening to anything really from show tunes to country to some Michael Blay thrown in there. <laughs> what is the most frequent assumption that adults make about you? Oh my god, if I had if I had the time, I would write a whole separate talk on this. But one of the worst assumptions I feel like I've gotten is that I do not have um the intelligence that uh, an average 17 year old would have. And so people tend to talk to me like I'm a toddler or a six year old. And usually it goes away once I start getting into a conversation with them and I use words like perspacious and, you know, some advanced vocabulary. And then they're like, oh, maybe, yes, she's, she's you know, has, she, can, she can hold a conversation with me. Um, but sometimes it just doesn't stop, and it's just like, why are you disregarding my opinion? <laughs> um, so that gets annoying, but I usually just try to, like, tell them with kindness and, uh, use big words, because that tends to, you know, make them realize that I can hold a conversation. Besides rowing, this is from, oh, actually, my friend, uh, Mia says, what has been your most impactful experience about being a disability advocate? Oh my goodness, so many. Um, definitely being able to, like, see the younger kids that, um, because I know little, middle school aged me would have loved seeing an older adult, uh, in a chair do cool stuff, and so seeing the younger kids in a chair and have them kind of look up to me and say, like, I want to be like you, and it's, it's really sweet, and it really warms my heart. Besides rowing, what other adaptive sports have you tried? Good question! Oh my goodness, so many good questions! Um, I've done swimming. I love swimming. It's so fun. I did it before COVID, you know, turned our whole world upside down. Um, I love swimming a lot. I did horseback riding for a while. I love that too. That's fun. Um, I've tried pretty much everything under the sun for sports. I, you just found out that I'm not a very athletic person. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm more of the, the sit on the couch and, and eat Chinese food and watching Netflix kind of gal. Not to, not to uh, wipe away the athletic physique over here. All that. How much of learning about your diagnosis came from your parents and at what age? And how much comes from your own experience and educating yourself? This is a good question. So my parents actually didn't really do anything on, on first, you know, uh like opening me up to the fact that i was disabled because again they never really made me feel like i was different i when i found out um i was in first grade and we were reading a book about people with disabilities and i heard them say cerebral palsy and i was like what's that called again and my support aide at the time was like lillian that's what you have and i was like i do and she was like yeah and so from then on i was like oh this is what I have. And then I, you know, I went to my parents, obviously, when I was a little older and asked them what it was. I've asked different people what it was. And then I've kind of just learned the rest of it from my mentors who are a little older that have seen me and just my own experiences. Do you like it when people hold doors open for you? Or do people assume or does it feel like people assume that you are less capable this is a good question um really depends on the situation like if it's an automatic door button that i can easily push then i'd prefer to do it myself but if i'm like carrying something heavy or it's a heavy door um then i'm gonna i'm obviously gonna need somebody else to open it for me so it really depends on the situation um 
in your opinion, is there a right for a right for parents to talk to their kids about their difference? If the kid brings it up, I'd say talk about it. Um, and like, even if they don't, I just I just say like, this is what makes you different, but it makes you special. These are your superpowers. Everybody has them, and like, try to explain it as something like special and cool, like a like Harry Potter uses magic, or or Superman has the ability to, the ability to fly. Um, phrase it like that, and I think it'll be definitely more positive. Uh, thank you. If we don't return to school this spring, what will you miss most? Okay, this is gonna sound really cheesy and sappy, but I'm gonna miss seeing my friends and teachers every day because <laughs> I, I miss my, my teachers, especially the two that are on here that I love um, so very much. Uh, and my all my friends that are on here that are, are school related, I love them too. And I'm gonna miss like just seeing them all regularly and giving them hugs. I love hugs. If I could give y'all a big, a big actual real life hug without getting any sick, I definitely would. Um, so that's probably what I'm going to miss the most. What is one thing that you wish that parents of kids with disabilities would know? Oh, that's really hard. Oh, because there's so many things I could say. Thank you for the deep question. Um, probably your kid is the only one that can decide how capable they are, right? Because when kids with disabilities are first born, the doctors give all these expectations of you know, how capable they're going to be and like if they're able to, if they're going to be able to like sit up or if they're going to be able to, you know, do things. I mean, that's a good start, right? That's a good start. But don't, don't use that as this is how much function my kid is using. Only your kid can tell you how capable they're going to be. So if your kid is past the doctor's expectations, that's great. And if they stay there, that's also great because it's, it's your kid's choice and it's what your kid's doing. What is one thing, oh, what is one thing you wish you could tell your younger self? Stop pulling away from people. We get it, you're angry, but, but don't take it out on your friends and distance yourself from them. Get help earlier. You know, tell people how you feel. Do something about it. From my seven-year-old, how many Harry Potter books have you read? <laughs> this has been interesting. <laughs> Because I actually haven't finished the Harry Potter series. I know, sue me. I just like Percy Jackson better. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, so I've read books one through six, and then I've read halfway through the seventh book, but I just, there's this one spot that I'm stuck on, and I can't get past. I don't know why. Just, just can't do it. Just, just can't. What has been your most powerful triumph thus far? Oh, this is also a deep question. Um, Oh gosh, uh, here I'll move the key. I'll move the chat. Um, oh gosh, that's wow. Uh, that's a deep question. Thanks. Um, probably just getting my walking frame, and because I have a frame that helps me to walk, and taking my first steps um, in that frame towards um, the people that have supported me, which has been really key to see, and hopefully after that I'll get to walk across the stage for my senior year graduation if COVID doesn't ruin my plans, but we'll see. Mm. All right, that's, I think I've run out of questions for now. I don't know. Take another minute. Are there any other questions for Lillian? And Nothing is off the table. <laughs> Nothing. I, I will answer anything and everything. Will you have a Will you have a roommate at uh, at college? So we haven't really worked that out yet. Um, we think that my PA, like a PCA, is going to be my roommate, but we're not quite sure yet. We just need to talk to the college, but we'll do that when it gets a little closer. Right. Can you tell us a little more about having a service dog? Of course I can. Um, well, my service dog is from Canine Companions for Independence, and they're a nonprofit. And what is so cool about them is that they do their service dogs for completely free to the recipient. So I didn't have to pay a dime. It's great, especially if you're a almost a broke almost college student. And what Frontier would do for me before he retired is he would pick up things that I drop 
and uh, you know, I acted all hot water bottle kind of when I had muscle spasms, uh, tore off my socks, and just break down the social barriers. People would want to talk to me as because I was the girl with the cool dog, not the girl in the wheelchair. That was super cool. And thank you so much for all the love. Oh God, there's one more message. Uh, uh, going off to college is hard for most everyone. When thinking about going off to college, what are you most anxious about? Oh, that's a good question. I have an amazing support system right now at LHS at my high school. And I love them all so much. I'm like, am I gonna have that good of a support system when I go to college? Like, what's that going to be like? Oh my goodness, are they going to be able to help me? Am I going to feel comfortable talking about what I need? It's like, all, all those. Uh, one last little thing. Can you tell us about the National Miss Amazing Teen Competition? Okay, sure. Um, so this kind of happened on a whim. I was in Puerto Rico with my family, and they had all gone down for a night swim. Me, I don't like swimming in the dark, especially when the water's really cold. For me, I need to have it be like a perfect temperature in order for me to swim. So I was like, I'll pass. And so I did what a young teen would do, which is fall down the YouTube rabbit hole. And I started talking, uh, watching these documentaries about Miss Amazing. And I was like, this sounds cool. And my brain was like, you should do this. And I was like, nah, you're not looking for me. But it, the idea wouldn't leave my head. So I was like, okay, brain. I'm gonna do this. And I did it. And I registered and did my talent and everything for states. And I guess they liked it, because lo and behold, they were like, you're a Massachusetts Miss Amazing Teen. I could not believe it. And then I went off to Chicago for nationals, and I was like, there's no way in heck I'm gonna win this. There's like all these kids that like started their own foundation, and I'm just a kid from Boston who like does her thing. And um, I won. And that was really cool. And when I went up to get my crown, my chair decided that it wasn't gonna work. And so I ended up making a huge fool of myself trying to get my wheelchair away, but I still got the crown and the sash, so it was all good in the end. Uh, we got a couple more questions, if you don't mind me answering those, David. Um, yes. I don't know. Uh, why do you wear leg braces when you're in a wheelchair? This is a common question that I get. And so with CP, because your muscles are so tight, it pulls other groups of muscles into different and sometimes really painful positions when it comes to standing. And because of the way my muscles are pulled, my ankles and my feet are incredibly kind of misshapen and I guess like deformed, if that's the word. Um, and so what the braces do is they keep them as straight as possible, which makes it easier for, you know, standing and transferring from my chair to another seat if I need to. What's my favorite animal slash color? Animal, unicorn. I'm obsessed with unicorns. It's so bad. I've got a bunch of unicorn memorabilia in my room. Um, my, my favorite colors are pink, purple, and white. I'm a total girl girl. So, um, I'm going to unmute everybody um, so we can applaud. But also, um, the... Uh, the thing about being lo loving unicorns is that um, they're used as a metaphor very often for something that is truly unique and special. So I can't think of a better way to describe Lillian. Oh, <laughs> you're, you're, um, 